Hello everyone, my name is Meredith Coleman McGee, and I'm reading to you a book, Nishida Visits the Smith-Robinson Museum. And I would like to thank Amanda Mason. Uh, she works at Legacy of Life Extension Foundation in Rankin County, Mississippi, for inviting me to read one of my children's books to her digital class. So I hope that everyone is having a wonderful day, that everyone is being safe, washing our hands, keeping our distance from everyone, and enjoying your digital learning. Now I want to uh, describe this book. First of all, this is volume one of the Moses Meredith Cultural Arts book, children's book series. And it starts, it started five years ago. At that time, Nishida was seven and she watched the movie Selma. It's a historical movie that took place in 1965 in Selma, Alabama. And some famous people were portrayed in the movie like Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, John Lewis, uh, Jimmy Lee Jackson. And so I'm gonna read to you the cover. After watching the movie Selma, seven-year-old Rashida was shocked about USA race relations. Her parents vowed to teach Rashida America's unruly past. She shares her adventurous journey through history with readers. Are you ready? I want you to pay attention. So I'm going to have some questions to uh, for you to think about uh, at the end. I want you to pay attention to the character, some things about her, and some things that she learns. Okay, we're starting. Okay, this is the first page. And this is an actual picture Selma supporters protest in front of the White House in 1965, courtesy of the Library of Congress. And if you don't know, the Library of Congress is the nation's library in Washington, D.C., where the president is. Now, hello, beautiful girls, handsome boys, and all readers and learners. My name is Rashida. I live in Jackson, Mississippi, not too far from you. I am in the second grade. My name means student. Grandma Nana named me. Mom and dad said I would learn something new every day for the rest of my life. After I watched the movie Selma, I was surprised about our history. My parents told me they were going to teach me something about my culture and country every Saturday. Mom and daddy showed me a lot of pictures. And of course, this is one of the pictures that, her, that the parents showed me. Today is Friday. We're going to the Smith Robinson Museum in the morning. That's a picture of a very famous breed in Selma, Alabama, and a famous picture of teenagers and children walking and protesting in the streets in 1965. Edmund Pettis Bridge, Selma. The picture was taken by a photographer named Carol Hansmith. And the caption says, Martin Luther King Jr. and others walked over this bridge 
1965. President Barack Obama and other walked across the bridge in 2015, which was 50 years after he, he historic March with Martin, uh, with uh, John Lewis and others. Photographer Warren uh, Lefter took the pictures of the black children protesting Jim Crow laws in 1965. Now, this is the next page. Mama read me a Bible story about a lady named Ruth. I like a good story. Ruth loved her mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth worked hard. The king was Boaz. He fell in love with Ruth and married her. The story had a happy ending. Mama tucked me into bed. See you in the morning, night, night. And her mother reads to her every night. And every child likes to read a good book. And I hope you enjoy this one. Okay. The next two pages. Good morning, readers and learners. We had a good breakfast at Grandma Nana and Grandpa Joe's house. Grandma made cheesy grits, scrambled eggs, sasha, and toast. Grandma is the boss of the kitchen. When we go to her house, we have to wash and dry the dishes. I help Grandpa put the dishes up. Now, we are headed to the museum. Which museum? The Smith Robinson Museum in Jackson, Mississippi on Bloom Street. If you haven't been, you got to put it on your bucket list. We're here at the Smith Robinson Museum. It was named after Smith Robinson. He started the first public school for African American children in Jackson in 1894. That was a long time ago. African American students attended the school until 1971. And the state of Mississippi obeyed the 1954 Brown versus Education U.S. Supreme Court public school segregation law. The law allowed children of different races to attend school together. Unlike today, 50 odd years ago, black and white children could not go to school together in the state of Mississippi. Imagine that, wow. <laughs> the first thing we saw when we walked in the Smith Robinson Museum were old wooden desks, which children used 70, 80 years ago. We saw a picture of Smith Robinson and W.H. Lanier. Miss Lanier was the principal of Smith Robinson School from 1912 to 1929. The near high school was named after him. That's the Bulldogs. <laughs> Pictures and sculptures in the museum are valuable. You cannot touch anything. A picture of Richard Wright is painted on the wall outside of the museum on High Street. When Richard was in the eighth grade, the Jackson Southern Register, a black newspaper on Ferris Street, printed his short story. His teachers were very proud of him. Richard could not check out books in the public library when he was a boy. That was used by whites, of course. The library was used by whites only. But Richard read a lot of books. And we had smaller libraries um, in the city with small collections of books at that time, 80 years ago. He became a famous writer. He wrote a book called Black Boy. His book told readers what it was like to be a black boy 80 years ago. Mama and Daddy 
graduated in high school. They attended Callaway High School in North Jackson. This is a picture of Richard Wright. And that's the same slave cop on the other side. Okay, back to Richard Wright's book, Black Boy. The two black boys in the book often stood in the corner of the kitchen watching their mother cook for a white family. They were hungry, but they couldn't eat. They ate the scraps off the plates when the whites finished eating. Most days, there was only bread left on the plates. Sometimes a piece of meat was left on the plate. There was plenty of tea. The boys hated being poor. We went upstairs at the Smith Robinson Museum and saw large images of Africans. One was skinny. They looked sad. The women were half dressed. The men had chains around their necks when they got off the ship. The people who owned slaves were mean. We put a leash around our dog's neck Walk her. Fluffy eats good. She is not skinny. Africans were kidnapped and brought to South and North Africa in ships against their will. One girl looks like me. I was sad this happened to me. Like they are women who lived in different communities in Africa were very fashionable. They beaded their hair like we do today. Here's a, a picture of African women in different hairstyles. I told mom and dad I didn't want to walk to the ship at the museum. It was dark. And the wooden Africans were lying on their sides. Mom and Daddy walked through. This is an auction block. Uh -oh. Courtesy of the Library of Congress. What is that? The nation's largest library. Humans were sold on auction blocks. This is a note that from the Library of Congress. Africans exposed during an auction. Exposed me. Their body was exposed. The highest bidder paid investors for the right to enslave Africans. The Africans worked for food and shelter and did not earn and our wages people do today. It was hard for them to escape their enslavement, forced labor, because they did not speak English, did not know the landscape, did not know how to get around. Daddy told me slavery was like the story of Moses in the Bible. Moses, the movie Moses came on a week or so ago. I, I love that movie. Moses is a slave's relative built pyramids and palaces for Egyptian kings. Africans in the United States of America built the White House where the Library of Congress is and some buildings here in Mississippi, the Mississippi State Capitol. Um, not, I mean, the old Capitol Museum. Uh, the Mississippi State Capitol was built in 1902 or 3. Um, Moses led the Israelites to freedom. They moved to another city. There were a lot of African American leaders back then. They were shaking things up. For us, thinking like 
better, like Harry Tubman, Frederick Douglass, uh, then later Martin Luther King, Edgar Evers, and Bob Moses. Edgar Evers, House off of Edgar Evers Boulevard, a must-see. You gotta visit his house. He's one of the biggest black leaders that ever lived. He's from Jackson, Mississippi. Lived in Jackson. President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Wow, proclamation is like one, two, three, four. We had to break it up four times. <laughs> in 1863, which freed the slave. This is an image of President Lincoln. Daddy said after slavery ended, Africans were called freedmen. We were also called black, colored, and Negro, and then later, Afro-American, Malcolm X, it was that name then. Officially, we started being called African-Americans. A lot of names. Mama told me whites in the United States were divided. Some of them wanted to be, wanted us to be full citizens. We could check out books from the library and vote. Other whites wanted us to be second-class citizens, eating food scraps off of their place. Some whites donated money and books to create Negro schools so that Negroes would go to school with Negroes and not with them. And here's a picture of Isaac and Rosa, the slave children in New Orleans, Louisiana, 1863. Boy, they was dressed up nice. Check out those leather boots. <laughs> Okay, and this is a, a school from 1916 in Henderson County, Kentucky, courtesy of the Library of Congress. What is that? The nation's big library. Okay, uh-oh, I think I got it straight now. You see the heater in the middle of the floor and those desks? That's the kind of distance that was in the, uh, similar to that, maybe a little more modern than I saw in the Smith Robinson Museum that day. Smith Robinson Museum gives visitors a good look at the history of African Americans. Before World War II, many Negroes in the South were poor. And here's a picture of Three children in Natchez, Mississippi, and I'm going to read the caption said, Four Negro children dressed in rags, posed for a photographer in 1927. You see it? Now, I am enjoying the museum and learning as we go. Daddy told me nobody can ever take knowledge from you. When you read and study, knowledge gets in your brain and it stays there. Now, this is a picture of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I'm gonna read the note. Nine Negro children enrolled in Central High School in 1957. Little Rock was one of the first cities in the South to follow the Brown versus Education Law. The U.S. Supreme Court Justice ordered the schools to desegregate, outline the separate but equal law. Separate but equal meant that it was legal in the United States of America to separate black kids and white kids in uh, education and everywhere. We separated the railroads, the guns, everywhere. And the Supreme Court outlawed it in 1956. Almost 100 years 
ethel statement that was out loud. I check out books at the Charles Tisdale Library. Oh, wow, they closed it. It's not open anymore. He was the publisher of the Jackson Advocate. His wife, Alice Thomas Tisdale, and daughter, Deanna Tisdale, published the newspaper today. During segregation, citizens paid a dime to see the movie. Wow. Sometimes African Americans sat in the balcony. And here's a picture of someone going to a bathroom. This picture was taken by Marion Wilcott. And the note says, Negro man going to the balcony of the Crescent Theater in Belzoni, Mississippi in 1939. Belzoni is about 100 miles from Jackson. White sat on the ground floor during reconstruction. Negro sat in the balcony of white churches and they said in the balcony of segregated courtroom. That's a separate but equal thing. Separate but equal. The Alamo Theater is one block over on Fair Street. 50 years ago it was a movie theater with one movie <laughs> for African Americans. Moviegoers could sit anywhere. Whites attended a different movie show. The Ferris Street Historic District was the first settlement in Jackson for freed Africans at the state. Lawyers, teachers, preachers, doctors, maids, and barbers lived in the area. Everybody lived in the same community. And this is a picture of how houses in Mississippi looked uh, in 1935, 39. Oh, that's the uh, man going up the stairs to the balcony uh, to see the movie, 10 cent admission. And this is uh, houses in Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1939. But houses over in Jackson look similar to that too at that time. And in Mississippi, we're still porch potatoes. People love to sit on the porch. <laughs> Now, James Meredith has an exhibit at the museum. In 1962, he became the first dark-skinned Negro to attend classes at the University of Mississippi. White started a gun battle with the U.S. government to try to stop his involvement this one black man. <laughs> President John Kennedy sent the army to the army. Two people were killed and hundreds were injured. Now, I'm going to show you two pictures. This is the army coming in. U.S. Marshals and Army trucks patrolling the University of Mississippi campus September 30th, 1962, the day James Meredith secretly became a student resident on campus. Uh oh. You see it? And over here is James Meredith walking on campus, escorted by U.S. Marshal, October 1st, 1962. So that's James Meredith, of course, in the center of two white U.S. Marshals who the Kennedy administration sent to Daddy bought a book for James Meredith at the library. Mr. Meredith signed his name in Daddy's book. A signature is very important. I learned how to write in cursive at home. I can sign my signature too. Okay, here are some more pictures. The first picture says, soldiers slept in tents in the field across from Baxter Hall where James lived to protect him from violent whites. The second picture at the bottom says, military vehicle outside 
of a building at the University of Mississippi, October 4th, they were still there. The uh, military or National Guard or the uh, U.S. Marshal. Three days after James Meredith integrated college. Integrated means he became the first black to go to an all-white college. That's what integration means. Here are the pictures. That's the soldiers living outside of University of Mississippi. And this is a scene from October 4th, 1962. Damn, it was a long time ago. The movie Selma opened my mind to our country's history. Mom and daddy's grandparents were farmers, an old man in Hans County, a great grandmother cooked for their family. Sharecroppers worked on someone else's land. They attended school a few months in the year if they had a school nearby. My parents' grandparents had an outhouse behind their farmhouse or outhouse. It's like a wooden building with a hole so you could sit on it and use the bathroom outside and sit in the house. I saw one. My parents' grandparents had an outside house behind their farmhouse. Sharecroppers often lived in two to three room houses. Sharecroppers used the restroom in the woods. I read that in another book, too. And here is an actual picture of a very small house that a sharecropper lived in. One of them is standing in front of the house. You see it? It's on page. There we go. Oh, we're getting down there. Sharecroppers worked long hours in the hot field for very low wages. Here are two pictures of some sharecroppers. See, that bag, that bag has cotton in it. And by the end of the day, that bag will be full, stuck to the max. And at the bottom is a picture of some sharecroppers who have been evicted. Evicted means somebody put you out of the house, out of their house that they own because you didn't pay the rent. Oh, boy. Young whites fought to change laws that discriminated against African Americans. Our race couldn't vote and did not have any representation in government. Some protesters used to shout, Jim Crow must go. Here's a picture in 1964 of young whites and blacks um, working together to try to make things better for uh, our race. Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party members that support them. No, the other side say, we shall overcome. That was in 1962. Over 120 years ago, Smith Robinson started the first school in Jackson on Bloom Street for African Americans. And you know, Smith Robinson was the first black lawmaker in the city of Jackson. Today, the old school site is a museum. The museum is the first site on the city of Jackson's civil rights driver tour. And we did the tour too. I am glad mom and daddy brought me here. I learned a lot today. Doing slavery was against the law to teach African slaves have to read and write. Reading and learning is one of the most important rights citizens have. Please don't take it for granted. During Jim Crow, public buildings were segregated. African Americans paid taxes but could not 
check our books for public schools. Smith Robinson is a pioneer in the field of education in Texas. Richard Wright read a lot of books. He was smart. His books told stories about life during his childhood, which was remember about 80 years ago. Never ever fought in the courts to change laws so African Americans can go to the library and vote and get good jobs. Mr. Evers helped get Mr. Meredith's case on the NAACP's list. Mr. Evers was killed in his driveway in 1963 by a white man who didn't want Mr. Evers changing white culture. James Meredith opened the college doors for our race in Mississippi. Now we can study to be anything we want to be. 50 years ago, African Americans could not study to be surgeons, dentists, engineers, and lawyers in Mississippi colleges. And now they can. June 5th, 1966, James Meadows started a 220 mile walk against war to encourage Negroes to vote and to travel the highways without fear. The white man shot him. Martin Luther King and others finished the walk, and they named it a march. Women fought for equal citizenship rights too. Fannie Lou Hamer, Anita Blackwell, and many others were civil rights workers in the 1960s and 70s. This is a picture of Fannie Lou Hamer. She's from um, um, Mississippi Delta. This says Fannie Lou Hamer, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party delegate, speaking to the Credentials Committee at the Democratic National Convention, Atlanta City, New Jersey, August 1964, about the harsh reality of Negro life in the great state of Mississippi. Here's Fannie Lou Hamer. She's a shoe. Hollis Watkins, Memphis Norman, Ann Moody, Carolina Lewis, and other college students started the city movement in our state in 1960 to end Jim Crow in lunch counters, at lunch counters. Back then, Jim Crow rules required blacks to go to the back of the restaurant on campus street, which is downtown Jackson, to buy a sandwich and a drink. Then they had to walk down the street with their sandwich and drink because they couldn't sit at the lunch counter and eat uh, like a decent person. White customers could sit down at the counter and rest and eat. The United States Congress voted to give Freeman voter rights in 1870. A mulatto Freeman named John Warnett for Natchez was elected to state government in 1871. The 1890 Mississippi Constitution removed the voter rights of Negro men who were voting before 1890 in Mississippi by, by the droves black men were voting. An African American named Robert Clark from Hans County was elected to state government in 1968. Oh my God, it was almost like 90 years before he even voted again. You need a black woman became the first African American woman elected as a mayor of a Mississippi City in 1976. Alice Clark became the first African American woman elected to state legislature in 1995. Next week, we're going to the Mississippi State Capitol a few blocks from on High Street from the Smith Robinson Museum. The state capital is the second site of the city's civil rights driving tour. On Saturday, we're going to meet an artist. You got to come to the museum. Learning history is fun. The end. Now I want you to think about some things about Nishida. And also some things about what Nishida learned. 
keep learning and reading. It's a very important right that we have. Let's stick together. Be safe. Wash your hands. Keep our distance. All right. Have a good one. Thank you so much.